what an introduction. Thank you, brother. Such a joy, again, to be with you, church. Such a privilege, so much that the Lord has done through the years. And here I am again to bother you with my beautiful French accent. <laughs> Let's get right into the word. First Samuel chapter 16. Um, yeah, if you need a Bible uh, to hold in your hand and follow with us, we will uh, stay in the text today in verse 1 to 13. So if you don't have a Bible with you, please raise your hand. We'll uh, uh, share a Bible with you. And if you don't have a Bible at home, you can keep it. It will be a gift that we give you tonight. So just hold your hand really high and someone will give you a Bible. Yes, we celebrated the first year. In fact, we, we started this this uh, church planting thing in 2017. So we've been at it for quite some while now, but uh, we celebrate the first year uh, since the official launching of the church uh, last year. And, and last Sunday was amazing, it was so encouraging to my heart and to the heart of the people that's been with us, uh, some of them since the very beginning and much of them uh, joined in the last uh, two years. And it's been a blessing. We had a time of worship, a time in the Word, as usual. And then we had a food truck come in to uh, help us just to, to share fellowship together, you know. But uh, fellowship is way easier with smoked meat, don't you think? <laughs> so we had brisket tacos and uh, pulled pork poutine. And we shared what the Lord has done in our lives together while we were eating that God is so good. Uh, today we'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1 to uh, 13. And, and today we'll talk about the heart. Talk about the heart. You know, I was just there at some point. Stop, uh, I stopped singing and just listening to you guys sing. And I believe this church is the loudest in Canada. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing to listen to you. And I was wondering, you know, what my ears are hearing is that... Maybe you just don't know, you don't, don't need that message I'm going to bring tonight. It feels like your heart was really into it. So maybe you're really good at faking it. <laughs> maybe for some of you, your heart is really into God. You love Him with all your might. And for some of you, maybe you're singing very loud, but the heart is not really there. I don't know where you are right now, but I want to go into God's Word and look at what God says about the heart and the importance of the heart for our lives and for our relationship with him. And I pray that the Lord will just um, encourage us. Just a very, I believe, encouraging message for us tonight. We'll talk about the heart. So how's your heart? Many of you come here with different kind of, of heart right now. Maybe a, a joyful heart. Maybe a discouraged heart, maybe a confident or doubtful or strong or confused heart, proud, humble, uplifted, heavy, hopeful, desperate heart. There's so many kind of heart you can have coming in this place tonight. But how's your heart really? The Lord says in his word, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. So important to keep vigilance upon your heart. But the Lord says also in Mark 7, for from within, from the heart of men come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. How important is it to keep watch on this heart of ours? And the great commandment given by Jesus in Matthew 22 is, love the Lord your God with all your heart. God is really after your heart. You know, when I came to church in 2004, uh, I met with Christians for the first time. And the, the first thing, we were a lot of, um, uh, we were Catholic growing up. And then we arrived at church and many people in the, the city, I come from Dronville and, and mostly people are Catholic there. And when you come in an evangelical church for the first time, many people were saying to me, you know what we are practicing here, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. With God. You heard that, right? It's not, it's not 100% true. Like, it, it's a religion. But what they were saying is that it's a religion of the heart. It's not just habits. It's not just, you know, doing stuff together in the church. It's not just religion. But it's 
the heart that needs to be fully in. Is your heart really set on the Lord in your life right now? Or are you just doing things for God? Getting into the habits. I love praying with you, Ray and the staff here. Each and every time I hear it at least one time, it's not just another Saturday. Because we believe it's not just routine. We don't come here just to do things. We come here to meet with God. And the Christian life is a life of the heart. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run though and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. Blameless here means whole. The Lord is looking on earth. He is seeking for people to have their full heart set on him. To have a full devotion to God and not just faking it. And that's what I'm calling you to tonight. Listen to this. The heart of Christianity is to have a heart after God's own heart. That's a lot of heart, but we will unpack it together tonight. Here's the main idea, and I will, I will read the text. I will set my heart on God. Extremely simple, as usual. Super simple, super powerful, and extremely important and essential for us. So let me read the text from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1 to 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel and said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There, remain, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is the word of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight in utter humility, knowing that, oh Lord, we can do nothing without you. We need your word. Father, we are hungry for your word. We need to hear a word from you in our lives right now. Each and every person is going through different things in their lives. Lord, look at them. Look at them as you looked on David's heart. Look at them as you looked on Eliab's heart, on Samuel's heart. Look at us, Lord, tonight. And by your Holy Spirit, show us what's truly in our heart. Apply your word to our heart. Change us and fill us with hope. Lord, I pray that you will bless your church tonight. We need you. I need you.
Heavenly Father, you know exactly, you know exactly what will happen through this whole sermon, through this whole meeting. And I pray that your name will be glorified in this church, in each of our lives. For your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Number one, heavy heart, receive hope. Verse one to four shows us what is happening here with Samuel. Samuel received a call from God to go, and uh, Samuel was here in, uh, in a grieving mode. So if you just look at the verse before the text we are in right now, in chapter 15, verse 35, we see that Samuel did not see Saul again after he's been rejected until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he made Saul king over Israel. So the first thing I want you to see in that text is what it says about God. In this first point, what it says about God in this first point, what we can understand about God is that God has a plan we don't know about. God has a plan that we don't know about. He is sovereign and he's doing things that we are not able to see or understand when we walk in the situation we are right now. God has a plan we don't know about. The first heart we will see in this text is Samuel's heart. Samuel is grieving, profoundly grieving. And with reason, it's not for nothing. You know, when we look at that text, we can take an example out of, of Samuel because he's not grieving because his house is too small. He's not grieving because his popularity is diminishing. He's not grieving because people don't like him. He's grieving first because the king, the very first king of the Jewish people and in Jewish history turned his back on God. That's a good reason for grief. Secondly, he's grieving because he's, he was very close with Saul. He anointed him. He worked with him. He loved him very much. And thirdly, Samuel loved the people of God. And he knew what turning your back on God will cause amongst his people. He knew the effect that will happen. He knew what turning your back on God will lead to. He saw it in Eli and his sons just before. When you turn your, your Bible and just look at the book before Samuel, it's the book of Judges. And you see how devastating it is when you turn your back on God. It means that nothing good will happen out of that. It will bring judgment on the people of God. And the future for Samuel right now seems very dark before his eyes. So it's normal that Samuel is grieving you know, the act of the very first king of Israel could set uh, the tone and the example for all the other kings that would come after him. It can mean a lot of disasters in the future. The days are dark and Samuel is grieving. It's tragic. His grieving is real. And for a time, God let him grieve. For a time, God let him cry. And I want to tell you, it's okay. There's a time for grieving. Maybe you are in this season right now. Maybe grieving the loss of a friend, a loved one. Maybe grieving the actions of someone around you who created a lot of pain to you. Maybe grieving over your own bad decisions and sins in the past few weeks. I don't know. But grieving is real. And what the Lord is saying is not that grieving is bad. Grieving is okay. The grief is real. It's painful. And there's a time for that. And maybe in your situation right now, God wants to, to tell you, go ahead and like Samuel, grieve, cry, scream to God. And if the only thing that happened through that pain and that grieving is that you bend the knees before God and ask him to do something in your life, it's a win. But here in the text, God talked to Samuel we don't know for how long, but after a time, after Samuel grieved a lot, God said, okay, now it's enough. There's a time for grieving, and there's a time for stop grieving. He says, how long will you grieve, Samuel? And I believe God wants to teach Samuel something. He wants to tell him that it's not mainly about you, Samuel. He told him, you know, when the people selected a king, said, we don't want uh, God to rule over us. We want a king. They rejected Samuel and said, we want a king like the other people. 
And God said, it's not about you, Samuel. It's me that they're rejecting. And again here, I believe God is telling Samuel, it's not about you. It's about my glory. I'm doing something that you are not seeing right now. But it will be all for my glory. It's hard and painful right now. And it's okay to grieve. But, but now, it's time to stop looking behind to Saul's failure. And to start looking to God and what he has in reserve for his people. It's time to look to him. Stop fearing what could happen because of what Saul did and start looking to the one who makes all things happen for his glory. The first reason, the first heart we see in this text is Samuel's heart to which God says, stop grieving and start hoping. Stop grieving, I have a plan. Stop, start hoping in what I am going to do with my people. And I believe the Lord wants to say that to many of you in this place tonight. Maybe you're in this place of grieving right now. Maybe you've been for time. And maybe for you, God is saying, that's okay. Continue to grieve. Continue to cry. Continue to pray. Continue to ask God to do something in your life. But in many of you tonight, God wants to say, there's a time for grieving. But now is the time to stop grieving and start hoping. It's a transition time in your life. He heard your tears. He heard your prayers. You have every right reason probably to be grieving and to be sad and to cry. But maybe God is saying, the transition time has come. Now it's time to stop grieving and start hoping. It's time to lift your, high, your eyes and look to the one who holds your life in his mighty end. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just like he did in Samuel's time, he's still doing the same thing today. God is still in control. God is still unfolding his plan through every single little thing, even through pain and suffering. Do you believe that? David believed it. And he wrote in Psalm 27, one of my, my favorite Psalms of all time, Psalm 27, verse 13 to 14. He says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That means I believe I will see the goodness of God in this time, in this life. Not only when I wake up in heaven and I see the goodness of God in full, but even in this lifetime, I will see the goodness of God. And he says, wait for the Lord, be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. If it's you tonight, listen. Hope gets you out of grief. Hope gets you out of grief. The Lord, maybe he's calling you to transition. Here he's, he's talking to Samuel and he's telling him, stop looking at the failure of Saul. Stop looking at the, the fallen king. God already has his eye on the better future one. God already has a plan. So stop crying over the king that the people chose for themselves. The human solution. You know, the, the king that man chose to reign on them instead of the king that God is, the divine king that rules over them. The human plan king will be replaced by the God plan king. It's a good thing. Even the grieving, you know, you, you fix your eyes on the things that are not going well, but God has a plan that is so greater than what you see right now. That's the best thing that can happen. God's plan is still unfolding. But you know, sometimes the worst thing that can happen to us is that God answers our prayers. <laughs> sometimes the, the worst thing that God can do is to give us exactly what we ask. We see that with King Saul. People were looking all around to other people, to other, other um, um, tribes and other cities and saying, they have it better than us. Our king is invisible. Their king is visible. He's there on the throne. We can see. We can talk. They can talk to their king and all of this. They can see it. It's pretty real. Us, apparently, is in heaven. It's ringing somewhere, and it's not really real. So give us a, a king that will ring on us, that we will be able to see with our eyes. God said, okay. They rejected God, and they asked for a human king, and God said, okay. You know, in Romans 1, the Apostle Paul is talking about the rebellion of men and how they rejected God and, and built themselves idols and, and have been given themselves to their own desires and flesh. And three times in, the, in Romans 1, these uh, four words are repeated. God gave them up. God gave them up. God gave them up. To what? To their own senses. To their own desire. To their own heart. 
And the wrath of God rests on them because of that. Giving us exactly what we ask sometimes is a form of judgment from God. So be very, very careful what you ask for. When it happens, it can get really ugly really quickly. And I see that so often with the people I serve. And it saddened me so much to see that. Oh, yeah, but it's so great. I know he's not a Christian, but I really want to get married with this guy. I really want to do my life with I know maybe it's not the will of God, but I, I think it's the best thing for me. Go ahead. It's a form of judgment. Here the people of God were looking around, saying we want a king like other people. We want what they have. It seems so much better, so much real. And Saul was the result of the people's hard desire. We see that in the Bible, like in 1 Samuel 8, verse 18. God already predicted what will happen because they chose a human, God, a human king for themselves. It says, and in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. In 1 Samuel 12, verse 19, it says, And all the people said to Samuel, now they understand what they did. Pray for your servants to the Lord our God. That we may not die, for we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. They receive exactly what they ask for, a king like other nations, a human, imperfect, sinner, and very bad king to rule over them. But God's grace is so great. Amen, church? God's grace is so great that even when we follow our own ways and even after rejecting him, the Lord pursues us and saves us from ourselves. He says to Samuel, I have a mission for you. You will go where I tell you. You will ask this family to join you to the banquet and you will anoint for me the king that I chose for my people. It's a daring task. It's a dangerous task. And Samuel is afraid because if Saul hear about that, that he's anointing another king, it will take that for treason and probably kill Samuel. But God has a plan also for that. It's all figured out. You will do a banquet. You will offer a sacrifice. You will call the people. And in secret, you will anoint the new king that will rule on my people. The king that I chose. The God king and not the man king. And in 1 Samuel 13 verse 14, we see the will of God. God is moving on with his plan. He is sovereign. We don't know the, the plan that God has for us, but in 1 Samuel 13, 14, it says, but now your kingdom shall not continue. He's talking to Saul after telling him that he is rejected. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So God is talking to Samuel saying, I am sovereign. I'm the sovereign God. What I say, I do. He said he will do that. And now God is executing his plan. He's talking to Samuel saying, Samuel, don't grieve. There's a time for grieving, but now it's time to hope because my plan is, is developing according to everything I plan. Everything is going according to plan. In Acts 13 verse 22, we have an explanation of what it means for David to have a heart after God's own heart. It's the direct opposite of what is said about Saul here. Saul has not kept what the Lord commanded. And in Acts 13, verse 22, it says, And when he had removed him, he's talking about Saul, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. That's what it means to have a heart after God's own heart. You hear the word of God and you say, Amen, and you do the word of God. You hear me, you hear the word of God and you trust him and you say, yes, I will walk according to the will of my father. And here God intervened to save his people from their own king who represents their own folly. And 1 Samuel is really a picture of the gospel. 1 Samuel is really picturing the gospel in many ways. God rejected the bad king to put the good king on the throne. David for Saul. When Jesus came to save us, he came to save us from being slave to Satan, the prince of this world, and to save us from sin and death, and to give us a new life. He came to take our place on the cross, and on the cross he took our judgment, and he rose again on the third day, and after three days he rose again, he shows himself to his disciples, and then he rose to heaven. And what did he do? He sat 
on his throne and this king will never be replaced. Jesus is the rightful king, rightful heir of David, rightful king of his people. Do you believe that? So praise God when we look at that. In 1 Samuel, we praise God for his grace. The gospel is God taking care of business himself. Saying, okay, you, you, you chose a bad king. Even in the Garden of Eden, it was the same thing. Adam decided to reject God and to reject the, 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 the sovereignty of God over his life and say, okay, I will be king of my own life. And he put himself on the throne and we know what happened. Sin, murder, abuse, and the rest is history. The, God, the gospel is God taking care of business himself and getting rid of the bad king and raising the king after his own heart on the throne. David will be one of the greatest pointer to Jesus. Jesus will be called the son of David. David will be a good king that points toward the Savior. Listen, maybe you are grieving over your situation right now, like Samuel, and you have trouble seeing good and finding hope, but know this. Lift your eyes up from the situation and put them on the Almighty God who has a sovereign plan that He is unfolding right now. Even if you don't see it, trust Him. Trust Him that He is doing something through the pain. I love the lyrics of this song, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. Do you know that song? Some of you maybe. I love the lyrics. It says, Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will rip in fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Listen to this. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. Amen, church. We may not see it right now. We may grieve. We may have a lot of difficulty hoping and seeing what good will come out of the situation we are in, we are in right now. But, but God has a plan. And we don't know the plan that God has, but we need to trust him. So it's not, now time, Samuel, to stop grieving and start hoping. So before we see a man who has a heart for God, we see a God who has a heart for men. And that's so encouraging for us. Second point, confused heart, receive wisdom. Verse 4, B to 12, we see now the plan unfolding a little bit. Here we will see Eliab's heart. We see that Samuel obeyed the Lord and go to Bethlehem and, and, and he command all the people to come to the sacrifice. And people are coming and there's a plan here to call Jesse and his son and for them to come. And he, God will show him. God will show him who is the future king among Jesse's son. So if the first thing is that God has a plan that we don't know about, the second thing to know about God in this part of the text is that God has a knowledge we don't find elsewhere. God sees things that nobody can see and nobody can know because God is omniscient. Omniscient, I don't know how to say it in English. Omniscient in French. God knows everything. There's nothing that is hidden from him. So here we see Eliab's Heart, God will open the eyes of Samuel on a very important truth. Samuel, his evaluation grid will be completely changed. And one of the greatest principles of wisdom will be taught him in this text. He goes ahead and obey God and send the invitation to Jesse's family. And Jesse receives a special invitation, a very high privilege to be called out by the prophet of God to come to a banquet. It's amazing. And so Jesse arrives with his sons and before offering the sacrifice and before eating the meat, Samuel said, I want to see all of your son. And as we read the text, we quickly realize that Samuel almost made the mistake of creating or repeating history. He almost created a, a, a soul 2.0 because he looks at, at Jesse's son coming to him and he sees Eliab and Eliab is tall, taller than all other guys around him. And Samuel look at him and say, surely, surely he is the future king. Surely it's him. He's a, a spitting image of Saul. Look at 1 Samuel 9 too. When we talk about Saul, it says that Saul a handsome, was a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of God, of Israel, more handsome than he. Why is it useful? I don't know, but it was pretty handsome. From his shoulders, listen to this, his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. 
And again, he repeats that in 1 Samuel 10, verse 23. When he stood, he talks about Saul. Among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And when we look at 1 Samuel 16, in verse 7 here, we see that Eliab is the same, is built the same way. Samuel is looking at him. And God says, do not look at the height of his stature. Samuel was about to do the same mistake again. There's a lot of looking and a lot of seeing in this text and these, in these few chapters. And again, just by seeing him, he knows nothing about Eliab yet, but just by seeing him, he's sure, surely this is the next king. He is big, he is tall, he has everything, all the appearances of a good king. He has it, it's him. I'm sure he's, he's taking the horn of oil and he's, he's taking the lid off and he's ready to anoint Eliab and he's thinking his heart is, is beating. His, like, it was an easy task. Like He's right there. It's him. But praise be to God, he stopped him. He said, wait a minute, Samuel. Do not look at the height of his stature. It's not him. Look at what God says. Here comes the wisdom. God says, don't look at his appearance. That's the main mistake. That we do so often as men. Men's criteria is to look at what is impressive to the eye. Isn't it? What a nice resume. What a beautiful family. Oh wow, what a well-spoken man. What a successful person. God said, stop looking with your eyes and start looking with minds. Because I have a knowledge that you don't find elsewhere. God is not fooled by the look, by the good look. God is not fooled by the good appearance. God is not fooled by appearances of success. Because according to God, success is having the right heart. Here it refers to the bad heart of Eliab. You know, when we hear about David, we think here he's talking about David. But here he's talking about the heart of Eliab. He's saying he is rejected. It's not him because of his bad heart. Do not look at the appearance of his height. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And the reason why Eliab is rejected, the reason why the seven brothers are rejected is because they don't have the right heart. It's not yet talking about David. This guy seems qualified even in, in the prophet's eyes. He's not. Listen to this. God doesn't want super skilled pretender, but super ordinary heart for him. God is teaching Samuel that appearances are deceiving. The Lord is not looking for impressive resume or great skills or the loudest person in the room to use for his glory. He's looking for heart fully devoted to him. That means don't put your trust in skills, in your ability, or in stuff that you can do, or in being seen in a group thinking that God will choose the elite among us. God will not choose the one who is so better than the other. Because the truth is, in front of God, we are all sinners, all weak, all incapable, and it's all grace. We are all needy and weak vessels, and the Lord only uses weak people. And I'm the first to be able to say that. I know that the Lord is not using people because of their skills, but because of their heart. The difference between God and me is that my vision is limited, but his is not. You cannot fool him. John Woodhouse, a Bible commentator, said, You and I both have limited points of view. We have limited experience, limited understanding, limited knowledge, and we make mistakes. But God is not limited as we are limited. That's why in the church we don't establish elders and leaders too quickly. That's the reason why we are so often influenced by what we see and hear and what we can count. And that's the reason why so many churches around Canada and around the world are suffering so badly. Because we see someone so impressive, we say, certainly it's the future leader of our church. And we put him up front, but the character is not there, the heart is not there, and the church suffers. Maybe you're grieving tonight is that you suffered from bad leadership in the church, from abuse in the church. God says, it's not my heart. It's because you put leaders in front according to the heart of men. 
Listen, when you determine who will be the next leader in the church, I know it's your heart, brother. When you choose your friends, when you choose your, when you choose your future spouse, don't look at what you can see only. But ask the Lord to show you what you can see. There's always more about a person than what meets the eyes. And if you have some years behind you, you know that it's true. What should we do then? Like Samuel, we should stop looking and start listening. Samuel saw Eliab and he saw something amazing. He said, sure, he's the future king. But God said, stop looking with your eyes and start listening to me. God knows. Ask God for his perspective and search for his wisdom in his revealed will. We have the book of God, the word of God that we can hold in our hands and we can seek his wisdom in the book and ask him to show us what we cannot see with our eyes. Samuel here is confused because he's so sure that Eliab is the one, but God spoke to him. And the word of God to him was the right guide to see the right heart. The word of God to him. Proverbs 18 verse 15 says, An intelligent heart acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. And there's no better place to, to seek knowledge and understanding than when we approach God in His Word. So stop looking and start listening. Don't choose your future husband, wife, leader, friend on what you see only, but take the time to listen to what God has to say about that person. He will make visible what you cannot see with your eyes. He will make visible what's hidden in the heart. And that's why cooking meat on a smoker is so spiritual. Yeah, there's some barbecue guys in this place tonight. It teaches me that low and slow always bring the best meats, right? Amen? The best result in the end. And it's true also in choosing leaders in the church. You know, I apply the same method with my smoker than with choosing leaders in the church. Low and slow. We want them to walk lowly, humble before God. We want to see them serve in, in small capacities and not necessarily uh, in the pulpit. We want to see them walk low in humility and slow. We want to take the time that we need to take to see what our eyes cannot see. We need the Lord to help us. You know, when you cook a piece of meat, a brisket, for example, for over 12, 12 hours, it's my favorite cut of meat. You, you, you know that you must keep your eyes on the, the piece of meat and look at it often because every piece of meat is different depending on the fat, depending on the weight of it, depending on the cut, and want to do the same thing with ministry. Time will allow us to see what God sees in a second. God will make it visible and as we pray and ask the lord to align our perception with his we'll be more and more convicted of the right decision to make about the person so if like samuel right now you're confused about maybe people in your life maybe some decision to make stop looking and start listening you know we are not that wise the earlier you learn that the better you'll be we need the wisdom of god and the Lord don't care about resume. He wants heart. If you're confused concerning someone or something, just cook them low and slow and let the Lord show you what you don't see. Eliab and his brothers are rejected because of their heart. No one left before Samuel. And Samuel could have just given up and said, okay, I'm going back home. The, the future king is not here. Maybe God made a mistake and he's not here. But here's the last point I want to show you tonight. Humble heart, receive courage. In verse 11 to 13, we see the choice of God. We see David's heart. And here again, I want to tell you what we can learn about God in this part of the text. Here, what we can understand is that God has the spirit that you can't live without. He is almighty and he's living in us. Here, Samuel talks to Jesse and says, hey, something is not right. Like I'm supposed to anoint a king here. And God has rejected all of your sons. And instead of giving up, Samuel this time has a lot of faith and said, Jesse, do you have other sons? Or are all your sons here? And one of the most sad things happened. 
Like it's a beautiful story because we love the underdog stories, right? We, we love it when the, the guy that is rejected is, is finally the one who's chosen. But here it's really sad when you, when you look at the, 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 the way of, of talking of the father in the story of Jesse. Here he's asking, and, and can you imagine that for a second? He says, are all your sons here? And, and Jesse said, ah, oh, the youngest is not here. He is keeping the sheep. I did not invite him to the banquet. And you just put yourself in his shoes. Like Jesse coming back home to his son after receiving the invitation to the banquet. The great prophet, uh, the great prophet Samuel asked us personally, he asked me to be at the banquet and he says, bring all your sons. And Jesse comes in his home and, and tells his son, guys, go and put your best clothes because we are invited to the banquet. Come on. And the guys just have their eyes wide open saying, wow, it's such an honor. And David is coming up with his clothes and, and his father said, oh, not you, David. You stay home. What? Yeah, yeah, you keep the sheep. And some of us would say, yeah, but pastor, someone needs to keep the sheep, right? It's just logical. It's just practical. The fact is, the next verse tells us that he sent someone to take care of the sheep and David came. So he, he could have done that earlier. But no, David stay, stay in the field. He's not even invited to the feast. He didn't even have a chance to be chosen from the prophet on a human perspective. Didn't Samuel ask him to bring all of his sons to the sacrifice? So we don't know why he, he left David behind. When I look at the story, I thought, I don't know. Maybe he was ashamed of his son. You know, all his sons like to play with swords in the field and he liked to play harp. I don't know why he left him behind. Maybe there's something else. Some, some, some theologian says that maybe he's a child of an, uh, another wife or, or something like that. We don't know, but he just, he's just not invited. And it's really sad. But Samuel said and decided that we won't eat and we won't do the sacrifice as long as your last son is not in front of me. Jesse and his, brother, and his son said, we don't bring David. But God saw David in the field. God has already set his heart on David. God has already chosen the future king. And young people in this place tonight, Samuel is here. Other people, young people here. I want to, to talk to you right now. David at that time was about 15 years old. You know what that means? God is not choosing people according to their age but he's looking at their heart you know church is not just for adults ministry is not just for adults if your hearts belong to God God wants to use you for his glory where he placed you maybe in your family maybe in your neighborhood with your friend maybe at school God wants to use you where you are it's not depending on your age it's not depending on your style it's not depending on your background God looks at the heart and God chose David, a young 15 years old man. And here, the teaching, and I want to end with this. Um, it means that we don't have to put ourselves in the useless category. We don't have to think that we are disqualified for ministry because we don't have the right skills and capacities and we don't have the right experiences in all of this. The Lord is looking at the heart. And maybe people disqualified you with their words or with their deeds. Maybe in churches you were put aside. Maybe you feel like God is treating you the same way. But God sees you like he saw David in the field. And he said to Samuel, go get him. The most important thing about David here is not only his humility in not fighting his father back to go to the banquet. Like there's a lot of humility in that. Just waiting, saying, okay, dad, I will take care of the sheep. I, I will do what I'm asked to do. I will do the small thing faithfully and you'll take care of the rest. But here the most important thing about David is that he is anointed. You know, when we talk about the life of David, we hear so often about the heart of David and how because David has the right heart, he is chosen by God. And in a sense, that's true. But what we see here is that David has the right heart because David has the right spirit upon him. 
is an, not, and I'm not talking about the anointing of oil here, but the anointing of the Spirit. The text in verse 13 says that the Spirit of God rushed upon him. God said, this is him. And Samuel anointed him, but the Spirit of God came on him. And when the Spirit of God comes on him, everything changed. First of all, troubles begin. You know, when we, when we come to Christ, often we, sometimes we think that everything will, will be a, a pinky road from here. Everything will be fine and good. But the thing is, trouble really begins at that point. But we are not alone. God put his spirit on David. And that's the most important thing about him. Because David will not have been the good king that he was if it was not from the spirit of God upon him. And I truly and deeply believe that. That is the qualifying factor, brothers and sisters. If you want to know how do I know if I'm qualified to serve the Lord, do you have the Spirit of God in you? Because God is not choosing people that are super skilled or super qualified. He's looking at people with the Spirit of God, with their hearts set on God, and said, that's sufficient. I love to glorify my name in weak vessels. When we are all that, so often we get all the glory. It's because of me. I'm awesome. The number of stories I could tell you of people that were in ministry and begin to think that way is because of me. I'm so good. I did amazing things. But it's so clear here that when the Spirit of God come upon him, that's the qualifying factor. Not your own strength, not your own wisdom, and not your own understanding, but to be dependent upon God. So if we saw with Samuel, you need to stop grieving and start hoping. If we saw with Eliab, that we stop looking and start listening. Here, we need to stop doubting and start depending upon God. We need him so much. But it's so great. Because with him, we can do all things through Christ. And we believe that. So when the Spirit comes upon us, Regardless of our weaknesses and failures and shortcomings, it's not about us being fit for the call, but about Him being glorified in and through weak vessels. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. David was a man after God's own heart because he did the will of God. But he could not have done that without the Spirit of God. And I close with Psalm 27 again. David, you can see his heart in this Psalms. We can find the heart that is after God's own heart. When he says in verse 8, you have said, he's talking to God and said, you have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. That's a heart after God's own heart. When you hear the will of God and you say, amen. And you answer to the will of God by doing the will of God. Will you set your heart on God tonight and not rely on your own wisdom? I come back with that first question, how's your heart? And will God find heart fully devoted to him in this church? You know, David did a lot for the glory of God during his time. The Lord is seeking for one person with the right heart. You have the spirit of God inside of you and God wants to use you. Will you answer, yes, God, I will do your will. Let me pray for us. Lord, I'm so thankful because reading this text and hearing this truth again, I know, I know, and I know so clearly in my own life that I could not stand here if it was not from your spirit, if, if, if it was not from your grace, if it was not because of your compassion and faithfulness and goodness towards me. Lord, we are all weak. We are all dependent. We are all unable in our own. You call us to a great mission. You call us to spread the gospel around us, to make known the glory of your name and to invite people to come worship you, recognize your glory and to cherish your glory. But God, we are so weak. But we want to hear your calling. And we want to answer as the church answered in Acts 4. They said, Lord, we need your boldness, we need your assurance, we need your confidence to go out and spread the gospel. And you answered by filling them with your Holy Spirit. And tonight, Lord, I pray, again, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Again, let's, God, uh, Lord, make us understand that uh, 
It's not because we are talented or good or anything else. As long as we have your spirit, we just want to answer to your calling faithfully, humbly, but filled with hope. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love and your goodness. Please continue to bless this church with people who are fully devoted to you and have their heart set upon you with all their strength. Thank you, Lord. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.